does sound as though the 3090 Ti is up to 10% faster than the original 3090 at 4K. And to make sure, we'll take a look at the 12 game average data, but we'll do so at not just 4K, but also 1440p and 1080p. Starting with the 1080p data, you can see despite using the Ryzen 9 5950X with low latency memory, we're still largely CPU bound at this lower resolution with average frame rates in excess of 200 FPS. So there's probably not much point comparing the 3090 and 3090 Ti here. For those of you targeting 1440p with ultra light quality settings, the 3090 Ti appears to be on average just 4% faster than equivalent 3090 models, seen when comparing the MSI Supreme X cards. Then at 4K, we're looking at a 7% performance improvement when comparing the MSI Supreme X models, so very underwhelming indeed. The 3090 Ti was 20% faster than the 1600 XT, so there is that, but we're talking about a stock 1600 XT, so you could probably halve that margin with a good overclocker. So in summary, the 3090 Ti wasn't even 10% faster than the original 3090, but the MSRP has been jacked up by 33%. So what about power usage? Well, we know the board power rating has increased by almost 30% to 450 watts, and that saw total system usage rise by an insane 18% to 702 watts for the Supreme X model, up from just shy of 600 watts with the original 3090. That is a horrible increase for just 7% more performance on average. Now, before we wrap up this review, let's take a closer look at the ASUS, Gamewood, and MSI RTX 3090 Ti graphics cards that we had on hand for testing, and we'll start with the ASUS Tough Gaming OC model. The RTX 3090 version was very large, but unsurprisingly the 3090 Ti is even bigger, weighing 1677 grams, which isn't that crazy in terms of weight, but the dimensions really are quite something, measuring 325 millimeters long, 150 millimeters tall, and a whopping 63 millimeters wide, making this a three slot graphics card. Externally, it really does look like any other 30 series tough gaming graphics card. There are three 100mm fans wrapped in an aluminium shroud, and on the backside you get a full-size aluminium backplate. The stainless steel IO bracket features three DisplayPort outputs and two HDMI outputs. Then getting down to the PCB, we find a PCIe 5.0 16-pin power connector, and since no power supplies support this connector yet, at least none that you can buy right now, though they have been announced, the 3090 Ti's come with an adapter that feeds three 8-pin PCIe cables into the PCIe 5.0 16-pin power connector. This is basically the same 12-pin connector that was featured on all NVIDIA Founders Edition 30 series models, but with just four extra sense pins. Probably the biggest upgrade for all 3090 Ti graphics cards though is the memory. Although the capacity hasn't changed from the original 3090, so still 24 gigabytes, the memory density and frequency has improved, upgrading the memory modules capacity from one gigabyte to two gigabyte, meaning there are just 12 memory modules now, not 24, and that means they're all on the front side of the PCB, and this will significantly improve memory cooling performance. It also means that the backplate is now just extracting heat from the rear of the PCB, and not also a dozen GDDR6X memory chips. ASUS has still included plenty of thermal pads on the backplate though, using it as a heat spreader. The heatsink is massive as you'd expect, and ASUS has gone with a nickel plated copper base for extracting heat from the GPU and some of the GDDR6X memory. For whatever reason, most of the memory chips are connected to an aluminium plate rather than the copper base, which won't be as efficient for extracting heat. Still overall, a very good looking cooler with an excellent mounting method for connecting it with the PCB. When put to the test installed in the Corsair Obsidian 500D in a 21 degree room, the Tough Gaming peaked at just 79 degrees for the hotspot with a peak memory temperature of 78 degrees. The fan spun at 2400 RPM and the cores typically clocked at 1.99 GHz, so basically 2 GHz out of the box. Also included for our day one coverage is the MSI RTX 3090 Ti Supreme X, and my word, this thing is a beast. It's without question the biggest graphics card I've ever come across, taking up four slots with a weight of 2,145 grams. It measures 305 millimeters long and stands 140 millimeters tall, but as I said, at 71 millimeters wide, it takes up four slots. Complete madness, this one. There are three 95 millimeter fans encased in a pretty bonkers looking fan shroud, 
and at the rear is an incredible looking back plate that has really a lot going on. There's brushed aluminium, LED backlit logos, vents, and a neat looking black skirt at the end. Oddly though, despite the massive IO bracket which takes up three slots, MSI has only included three DisplayPort outputs and a single HDMI output, so one less HDMI port than what you get on the ASUS model. Where the Supreme X appears to be in a league of its own though is that gigantic cooler. Man, this thing is next level. Whereas the ASUS Tough Gaming was a combination of heatsink fins and aluminium brackets, the Supreme X is pretty much all fins. There's eight nickel plated heat pipes that extend throughout the fin stacks and connecting the GPU and GDDR6X memory to the heatsink is a very large nickel plated base. And in this example, it makes contact with all 12 memory modules. Finally, when put to the test installed inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, again in a 21 degree room, the Supreme X peaked at 88 degrees for the hotspot with a memory peak temperature of 82 degrees. But crucially, it is worth noting that the fans spun at just 1700 RPM, so the Supreme X was virtually silent. The cores again typically clocked at 1.99 GHz, so again, basically 2 GHz out of the box. Now unfortunately I only received the Gainwood RTX 3090 Ti Phantom GS the day before our review was set to go live, which is why I didn't include any results in our graphs. But I did have time to install it in our test system and run it for an hour for a temperature analysis. But before we get to those results, let's take a quick look at the card. As you'd expect, this is another triple slot design. There are three 90mm fans embedded in the plastic shroud. It's a cool looking design and there are some black anodized pipes that run end to end and they look a bit industrial. Then around the back is a full size back plate with some air vents cut out towards the end. In fact, it's quite a large section of the back plate as the PCB is very short. Gamewood has managed to cram their premium RTX 3090 Ti graphics card onto a 205mm long PCB, which is impressive given the card is 310mm long in total. This means there is quite a large section of the card that allows air to pass through, and this should help quite a lot with cooling performance. Like MSI, Gamewood has gone with a single HDMI output, but there are also three DisplayPort outputs as well, and of course there is a single 16-pin PCIe 5.0 power connector. Now the Phantom Gaming GS is quite heavy at 1837 grams, thanks to a large triple slot cooler, packing eight heat pipes and a large copper base. Gamewood's been very generous with the thermal pads, and there's a good amount of them found on the back plate, so overall a solid looking 3090 Ti. When put inside our Corsair Obsidian 500D in a 21 degree room, the Phantom GS peaked at 84 degrees for the hot spot, with a peak memory temperature of 76 degrees. These temperatures were achieved with a fan speed of 1850 RPM, so in terms of cooling performance, the Phantom GS doesn't appear to be all that dissimilar to the absolutely massive MSI Supreme X. The core is also typically clocked at 2 GHz, so a fraction higher than that of the ASUS and MSI models, though the difference here is negligible. Right, so at this point I can sense a few NVIDIA fans saying something like, what about ray tracing and DLSS? Why haven't you talked about those? Is it because you like the 600 XT? Maybe it is, isn't it? Admit it, just admit it. No, it's not because I like the 600 XT. If you think that's the case, then you probably haven't watched my 600 XT review. The reason I haven't talked about or even shown ray tracing and DLSS benchmark numbers is because I don't want to, it's pointless. I'm pretty well, pretty bored at this point. I've shown you the benchmark numbers of how it compares with rasterization performance, how it compares to the 3090 and ray tracing and DLSS is gonna scale no differently there. Just tack on a few percentage points and you'll have your 3090 Ti numbers. So. Yeah, the, we've, we've had the 3090 for like 18 months now, as I've said numerous times. So if you want to know how the 3090 Ti performs in ray tracing and DLSS performance, well, go have a look at the 3090. As I said, add a few percentage points on there and you'll have your answer. There is absolutely nothing new here in terms of ray tracing and DLSS. Had the 3090 Ti slotted in around the original 3090 price point, then, you know, might've been an okay release. Not amazing. Again, we are talking about 18 month old hardware here, but the release wouldn't have been entirely horrible. Of course, I am very, very keen to hear what you guys think about the 3090 Ti. And with that, I'll be heading to the comment section to make sure I read everything that you guys have to say about these new graphics cards. And with that, uh, yeah, like, subscribe. If you did enjoy the, the review, do hit that like button for us. That helps a lot. Subscribe because yeah, always more content coming up worth watching. And if you'd like to get some more behind the scenes action, some more insights and stuff like that, then feel free to check out Floatplane or Patreon. You've got access to our exclusive Discord server. 
monthly live streams of Tim and myself, uh, Q and A's, and then yeah, behind the scenes content. So a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, check those links out. As I said, they are in the video description, but if not, perfectly fine. And thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.